And now, verse 8, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which, that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. And we'll leave it there. But the whole story looked too beautiful, isn't it? And um, <clears throat> Father, I just pray that we would somehow see what the shepherds saw this morning, Lord. We'd see your son, Lord, manifested in the flesh, Lord, born of a virgin, Lord, come to save us. Lord, we worship you this morning and let Christ alone be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, <clears throat> Shepherds, shepherds, there's a wee thing, I was in the prayer meeting last night, you know what you have in the word is wood, hay and stubble, or you've got gold, silver, precious stones, you know that passage, that it's tried in the fire and whatever remains on judgment day is what remains and that's the things that are eternal. And... People were praying about, um, well, there's lots to pray about that's on the news, for instance. There's Iran, isn't there? There's uh, the fires in Australia. There's all the politics, Brexit, you name it. But if I, uh, if I showed you a basket or something uh, and it's lined with straw and there's gold, silver and jewels, real jewels, like, I says, look at this. I don't think any of you go... <laughs> Look at that straw. That is some straw, I tell you. My, my, look at that piece. Would you, you, what's your eyes going to be taken with? And you know we live in a world and all that new stuff, it's wood, it's hay, it's stubble. That's all it is. And we this day can look at Messiah. And people want to look at the news. We can look at the gold. We can look at the silver. And we can look at the precious stones that is our Christ. There's no greater treasure in this world than Christ. And <clears throat> to look in these things that are temporal, the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We're learning about shepherds this morning. We're learning about Christ. And we're learning about Mary and Joseph. We're looking at them. But what about those things? Every one of them is eternal, isn't it? Is Mary alive today? Thank God she is. Is the shepherds, are we going to meet them? Are they eternal? Thank God they are. Why? Because they know this lamb. Because I live, you will live also. And I'm looking at people who are eternal this morning. We're not looking at gold, or we're not looking at wood, hay and stubble in this room. We're looking at the gold. Christ is in you. There's nothing greater than Christ. All this rubbish that people worry about, God is not, that's not what he's producing. Do you know what I mean? That's just a byproduct of the love of the saints and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. All things work together for good for us who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So next time you're watching the news, just think to yourself, is this a little stubble? 
It's just a load of old straw I'm looking at. I'm going to go and look at the Saviour instead because he's not changing. That changes, doesn't it? It comes and it goes. Where's Herod today? He's just stubble. Where's Al Pilate? Nothing. Gone with the wind. We look at the things that are eternal. That wasn't what I was going to bring. But I was in the prayer meeting last night. It came before me like a wee picture of straw. Just straw. And then the treasure. And I'm like, what would you look at? So let's look at the treasury of Christ this morning. So these shepherds. <clears throat> I'll just make a couple of small points about them. These were not some common run-of-the-mill person. These shepherds were very specific in Bethlehem. They had the role of looking after the lambs. And I don't know who knows or who doesn't know this, but it's probably known by some and some not, not known by others. But the, where they lived, it was um, uh, Beth Migdal or something. There's a whole thing on it, it would take ages. But there, you can prove it in the word and the locations and stuff. Um, that it's Bethlehem. So it's near, it's not far from Jerusalem there, and you can go. And what they would produce out in Bethlehem was the same job as King David would do, really. He was a shepherd, do you remember? And the lambs that they would be producing is the sacrificial lambs for the temple. They're not just shepherds selling a bit of wool, selling a bit of meat. These shepherds, and this is what every shepherd, you'll see the symbolism all the way through here of a shepherd of a church, a pastor. This is the greatest message. If you want to know how to be a pastor, learn about the shepherds. Because this is God's version of a shepherd. Now these shepherds were living for one thing. Not profit, not honour. They were watching their flocks by night. They were living for the redemption and the sanctification of Israel. Their goal was to produce the lamb that the high priest would bring and take the blood and all the nation would be forgiven. That's what this... The life of these shepherds, these godly, holy shepherds, were living for the sanctification of others. And any shepherd at a pulpit, that's what he should be living for. To bring forth, as it were, the Lamb, Christ Jesus, evidently crucified before you. Why? Just to get a a name, just to, to build a big church, just to get a good tithe. For the people to be sanctified, to be clean, to be right with God. You know, if you have a big congregation and it's full of carnality, you are an utter failure in the eyes of God. But these shepherds were trying to bring forth something spotless. Now, they couldn't just bring any lamb. This was their, their, their careful watching. They had a flock, and they're watching their flocks by night. But there was a, they had their eye on certain things, the lambs that they felt were qualified to be spotless, to be perfect. The last thing they want is a wolf or a, a thief or a robber coming and touching that. Because they're banking on that for the forgiveness of the people. They are counting on that or all's lost for Israel. You need a lamb. You need a spotless lamb. And we need a spotless lamb, thank God. And, you know, so a shepherd, number one, is living for the sanctification of Israel. The redemption of Israel. And are you living for that when you're around saints? Are you caring about that? Does that matter to you? Do you know the only thing that matters to me about in this prayer meeting, in every fellowship, in every church meeting, is that people are made right with God. That's all I care about. That I live right, that they live right, and we're all blessed, serving God, and that everything is at peace and full of God's goodwill. The second thing a shepherd is, is he's a warrior. King David, before he killed Goliath, was reported by, when Saul was inquiring, is there somebody who can play skillfully? They says, well, there's this man who can play skillfully, and he's a mighty man of valour. This is before David's had a public fight that's recorded in the word. He's known to be a mighty man of valor because a shepherd is not some wee boy who's got a rubbish job. A shepherd had to kill. A shepherd was a dangerous man. And if you think about it, you know, when that wolf came, it, was, it made a big mistake. When that bear came, when that lion came, David's on it. And he struck it with the stone and then he went up close into the battle. He was a fearsome fighter. He was a terrifying proposition for anything that would harm the lamb. And I believe David, now I, don't, I can't prove that from the word, but I believe David was... The Jesse's lambs were for sacrifice. Do you remember even um, Samuel said we're going to do a sacrifice up at David's, remember? So um, it wasn't unheard of to, to, to go there and to do that. And, <clears throat> you know, a real shepherd is dangerous to wolves. If a shepherd will not call out the false prophet, if he will not warn against false doctrine, he's no shepherd. Imagine just letting the wolves take the wee lambs. And that's what happens today. God TV is full of liars. It's full of prosperity nonsense. And there's a lot of preachers wouldn't say boo about it. 
you know, Bethel music is filled with, the actual church Bethel is filled with heresy, filled with lies and, and, and false visions and, and um, the exaltation of man rather than Christ. And yet it just goes on and on. And I'm not a shepherd. Thank God I'm not fit to be one. If you look at the qualifying list, I actually believe that matters. <laughs> You've got to be your whole house in obedience, on and on, husband to one wife, on and on and on, blameless, you know, an example in everything, you know. I'm just not qualified. But those who are it must warn and keep the wolves away, really. Keep the wolves at bay. A, a shepherd who's wishy-washy is no shepherd. The sheep aren't safe under his watch. <clears throat> The third thing to do um, is their message in verse, let's see. Verse 17, these are the shepherds. Now, this, the shepherds have been waiting for the redemption of Israel. They've been longing for a, a spotless lamb every year and the high priest been bringing it up. But we know that that's a type and that's a shadow of the true lamb. And that's why the Lord, when he came, he said to them, unto you this day, these are the men who want the lamb. These are the men who are going to bring the lamb to the temple. And the Lord comes and says, unto you this day is born in the city of David a saviour, a lamb, Christ the Lord. You know, they had the shadow in God. All the shadows were banished, weren't they? Do you remember it says a great light? Shine around. No more shadows. He's here. You were living for the spotless lamb. I have provided for myself a lamb. And then they were thrilled. They knew this. This wasn't that news to them like, I don't know what he's talking about. This shall be the sign to you. And why was it a sign to them? And it was born unto them. It's so personal. These shepherds had one of the greatest supernatural revelations of any human beings in all history. And you know, if you want a supernatural revelation, make sure that all your life, all you watch is the lamb. That you're looking at the lamb, that you're obsessed with the lamb. What's a shepherd's life all about? It's all about the lamb. What's a carpenter? It's about the wood. The shepherd's all about the lamb. It's all about the sheep. It's all, it's all he looks at, watching over their flocks by night. And if you in your life will watch Christ, just forget everything else. Look at Christ and care to see him brought forth, the image of Christ out of every believer. Then God will show you things that other men just won't get to see. They are asleep to it. The rest of the thing's going about their business, isn't it, the whole time? Heaven comes down and the shepherds get to see it. No one else gets to see it. Even Mary and Joseph didn't get to see heaven opened and the great company of angels proclaiming him and singing his praises. And these shepherds have this revelation of God because it's unto them, because God has rewarded. You talk about reward and faithfulness. They've faithfully been living only for this and God is well pleased with these men. And you see there's a whole chapter here devoted really to their testimony in their lives. And if someone will make their life all about Christ, God will put you in a story in a very real way. Because this is a new year and people are praying about what will happen this year. What'll happen. I'll tell you what will happen this year. Whatsoever God does, it'll be forever. God's going to do something in 2020, just like he did in 2019, that's forever. God's doing forever things here. He's not doing a wee temporary blessing in the church. He's making someone tomorrow, today live forever. Someone in January, in, in uh, February, live forever. Amazing. The, of the increase of his government and kingdom, there should be no end. It always gets bigger. It must sicken Satan that the kingdom of God just grows because it can't shrink down because it's forever. Do you know what I mean? He adds one, the same dude. It's another one, another. And it's in New Jerusalem. It's the bride. You know, in Adam, it started with a marriage, didn't it? The creation. But look right at the end. What did it end with? A marriage, isn't it? It's all about love. That's, what, that's why the whole earth's here. It says, now the end of the commandment is charity. Out of a pure heart and a faith unfeigned. What's the reason of everything? It's love. That's why without love, then um, uh, it says that it's the greatest. Love is the greatest. You know, there's faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these. That's what God's after more than anything, is love. So we will love the Lord Jesus here. So they came, and I uh, got away from verse 17. Verse 17, they came to this um, manger. And, and of course the Lord gave them a sign. People want to give you a prophecy, but they'll never give you a sign these days. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, you'll be doing this and that. Well, what's the sign of it? You don't want me to be biblical, do you? <laughs> you know, do you notice how often it is? Hezekiah, you're going to get better. And what sign would you like? Would you like the sundial to go forward or back? Oh, now, we're on, now we're on to a healing ministry here. The sundial's going to move at your word? Oh, yes. 
That'll be the sign that you're going to get better. Well, it's easy for it to go forward, is it? <laughs> I'd love to see somebody even do that. That's, that's a mighty miracle too, but make it go backwards. Ask some heart of God if you've really got God in the, in the picture. I'm back. And went, didn't it? Because he's outside of time. You know, Satan couldn't get him. He, he's wanting to stop Messiah, but God has an advantage, such an advantage. God can step outside of the scene of time and go and do something in the future. He can go back, even if he wanted, do something in the past. He can get to Sunday and say, back it goes, Hezekiah's not sick anymore. I just turned back time for him. Do you know what I mean? The devil has no chance because the devil's locked in on time. He mightn't be locked in physically the way we are on the earth. He's a spirit being, but he is locked in time because he knows his time is. Uh Uh-oh. He's in a small dimension that's coming to an end for him. Thank God, but our God is from everlasting to everlasting. So these shepherds came in, and I want to say a couple of wee... I don't usually bring anything facts and interesting things, but these blew my mind. I actually read some of these. I didn't know about the the thing. So a manger's made of stone, okay, in Israel. It wasn't a wee wooden baby cot. It's a it's a stone thing. It's carved out of stone. So it's static, you know, it's it's not something that even move, it's it's where it is and that's it. And but they said this would be the sign you'll find the baby lying in, in the manger. So they went to the manger and this they'll be wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, they knew what this meant. This was extremely moving for them. They saw this baby in the manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, these shepherds, their job, their number one job, as you know, is to produce a spotless lamb. And then they're watching, they're so careful that nothing will happen to the spotless lamb because that's what they're banking all their hope on. And that's what we bank all our hope on, the spotless lamb, the Lord Jesus. So what they would do, they'd be that careful. When they had a lamb that was qualified, there'd be such a fear coming up to the time that something could go wrong, that they would wrap that lamb in cloths and put it in the manger. I don't know if you've heard that, that they would wrap the physical lamb, the shepherds. Shepherds would use this because this is for animals. This is not for people, this place, this barn. And they would put the, the lamb in the, bar, in the actual thing. So they had seen many times, imagine the scene, a lamb wrapped up so it won't even get a bruise. It's like a protection from anything that could go wrong. That this wee lamb, they're, looking, they're so careful with this great treasure. And now they look coming at it's a baby. And it's just the way they would wrap a wee lamb. And they know what it is. It's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They know who this is. And you know, the God of all the universe, at that moment, you could look at this wee place, this size, and say he's going to take away the sin of the whole world. Just that wee tiny baby is going to take away all of our sins of every generation. The, the scale and the magnitude of who he is in that little, you know, God manifest in the flesh to come down is so incredible. Now, <clears throat> these men got to see that. So what, do, what, is, what is a shepherd? Verse 17. Now, when they'd seen him, you see, and that's when you'll start talking about him. They made widely known, verse 17, the saying which was told them concerning this child. What does that mean? They were the gospel preachers. You've got um, Anna in the temple as a gospel preacher, sort of. She's going around talking about all those, just like the shepherds are living for. She's living for one thing, talk to everyone who's waiting for redemption in Israel. That's all she's interested in, the redemption of Israel, the redemption of God's people, the sanctification of God's people. But she's saying he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Now the shepherds were the first gospel preachers in history. The very first, because they now had seen him. And they weren't saying he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. They're saying he's here. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is the John the Baptist type ministry, way ahead of John the Baptist. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And they were telling, widely making it known. And see a shepherd, and that's not all he's preaching. You know, we have one message, Christ and him crucified. Uh, I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ, Paul says, and him crucified. Yeah, T- Christ, when he's preaching, they, said, they, they accused him. They said, you bear witness of yourself. And he says, even if I do bear witness of myself, my witness is true. Who, who could he preach? There's no one greater. He has to preach himself. A greater than Jonah is here. A greater than Solomon is here. You know, uh, destroy this temple. He preaches himself because there's no greater message. And then Paul preaches Christ. Peter preaches Christ. Philip, when he's uh, preaching in um, is it Samaria, he preaches uh, Christ, uh, Christ. And then he goes to the eunuch and he changes his message. It says, and he preached unto him, Jesus. So change it from Christ to Jesus. That's about as far as you, you can change your message when you're a real shepherd. That's about as far as you'll go on changing your message because it's all about the Lamb. Everything is about him. And we don't know his greatness at all because we're so busy looking at wood, hay and stubble. We haven't seen the glory of the Lamb. And the glory of God and the glory of the Lamb here, that's the, them as preachers, is seen 
all of heaven. You know, um, I talked, I don't know who heard it, but I talked about the four creatures and the angels are in heaven. And what's in the midst of the throne? It's a lamb. That's his greatest glory. That's his manifestation of his glory as a lamb. And he, it's what he brought himself as on earth. And they're all going out all day and all night. Holy, holy, holy. They can find no flaw in him. They're defining him. He's holy. But they're also amazed at everything he does. Everything he does. Holy! Holy! Everything God's ever done. People are going to get better with God. You ain't seeing. Holy! He's done something else. Holy! He's so full of love. He's so full of compassion. And all these angels and all of these saints and all of these creatures, all they want to look at, they can look at anything in the universe, these creatures wise, anything in the universe. Holy! They can only, all day, and then all night, and then what are we going to do tomorrow? All day and all night. And you don't want to look at the Lamb? Are you kidding me? You are blind. This being is the most glorious, glorious, glorious being that even is known to supernatural beings, let alone man who is a worm. We sh- the privilege we can have to look at a carnal world and then look at someone who's holy. Let's look at him today and see his glory. So these angels spend their time doing that, but now the Lamb has come to earth. So what are the angels going to do with their day? Well, we're going, aren't they? If you go to Hebrews 1, just to prove it, Hebrews 1, you know, God doesn't need to motivate those who actually see him. You can't, they can't get enough of him. Peter, when he was said, do you want to go away? Do you want to go and do something else, Peter? Even for a day? Where would I go? You alone of the words of eternal life. Peter knew temporary things do not matter. And they don't matter at all today. If we go to Hebrews 1 and verse 6. Verse 6. This isn't really preached enough or known enough, I don't think. But then whatever I think doesn't really matter. But you have probably heard loads about it. Because I don't know what you have heard. But I haven't heard enough about it. Verse 6. But when he brings again the firstborn. So there's a when here. When is this? When he brings the firstborn. Who's that? Into the world. That's Christ. That's the birth of Christ. If you look at it before. Today I have begotten you. You'll be, I'll, be a father, to him, I'll be to him a father. And he will be to me a son. This is at the birth of Christ. This is talking about. He says... Now, he doesn't command them. What does he say? What's the, what's the word of God to the angels? Let, let. He doesn't even need to tell them to come. He just says, let them. Let all the angels of God worship him. And who wants to come? There's the voluntary offer for, from God. And it said, a multitude of the heavenly host came praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. They were praising him. They came down from heaven because he's come down from heaven. And they all the angels of God that day worshipped him. How many does that say? How many angels came out of heaven that day? Or were seen by those shepherds? The Bible says all the angels of God. There wasn't one left. How could there be? Anyone who sees the lamb wants to be with the lamb. And those that are with him, you know it says that they're, they're dressed in white and they're called, they're faithful. And they're, they're, they're called chosen and faithful. And they follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. And do you remember in Ezekiel, the spirit, it says the wheel within a wheel. We're, we should be so bound up in Christ that where he goes, we go. We're like Ruth. Wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you're buried, I'll be buried. That's the tomb. And wherever you, you die, I'll die. That's the cross. We're so obsessed when we'll go all the way and buried with him in baptism, up again from the thing. The Christian is obsessed with Christ and loves him. And all the angels of God came down. So they talked to the shepherds. But what was that? Was that their main thing? Didn't they go to the stable? Surely they went to the stable first. It doesn't say, but it does say when he's born, they all worshipped him. Of course they did. And I believe they were all at that stable. I don't know how that works. These are spiritual beings. And they beheld him. And that they said, it, uh, Paul says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, um, looked on by angels. Looked on. They saw him. Uh, preached among the Gentiles. I don't know how far and wide the shepherds went. Believed on in the world. And then the ascension received up the glory. That's the mystery of godliness. And notice none of it's about your behavior. It's about what you're looking at. This God manifest in the flesh. So... That's it about the, 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 the wee thing. I'll just finish off here with a couple of wee facts. Um, so the lamb, when was it sacrificed? The lambs were sacrificed on the third hour, a lamb every morning, a lamb every evening, and the ninth hour. Um, every day and Christ was on the, put on the cross in the third hour the time of the first sacrificial lamb on Passover and in the ninth hour he said 
into thy hands I commit my spirit. And you want to wonder, is he the sacrificial lamb? And is start of his death and the end of his death match the death of the two sacrificial lambs on Passover? And then the swaddling cloths. I need to check this one out, but I'll just put it out there for food for thought. Um, it was a custom at the time when people were travelling that people would wrap themselves in cloth or, or a, like a, a blanket that would be used as a death shroud. So... If the traveller died, there's no insurance, there's no 999. This is just, you find a stranger land on the road, like a road to Jericho. So the, the custom was that the dead traveller wouldn't be a burden on whoever had them, that they have to wrap them up and deal with all that. that you've got, you basically are bringing your coffin with you. Do you understand what I mean? They didn't have a coffin in those days, but they had this, these swaddling clothes. And so they reckon then that what Mary wrapped around Christ was her own shroud, as it were, her own one that she would have wore on her journey, travelling. Joseph would have had one. Everyone would have had one that they wear, but if they die, well, you wrap them up. That's big enough to use. And that she had nothing for him then other than that. And the word picture there would be, you know, well, it's strange because the Spirit of God did speak to me before she knew this, didn't quite understand it. Swaddled in birth. Swaddled in death. That's what the Lord said to Leanne a while back there. And she didn't quite know what to make of it. But, um, you know, Christ was wrapped, do you remember? With linen in the tomb. But there's Mary. She takes what well, it's her death shroud and it's put on the wee lamb. Do you know what I mean? It's put on Christ because ultimately he's going to die her death, isn't it? And he's going to die our death. Our death was put upon him, isn't it? Our sin. And when he was swallowed in death and then he came out of the grave and the grave clothes are gone, you know, that's the victory. We don't have any. We're never going to be shrouded with death. It's only in our shadow when we pass through the valley of death. And... Um, I'll leave it there for the sake of time. But look on the lamb, look on the gold, silver and jewels that is Christ the Lord um, this year and every year unto eternity. Amen.